This will be uh, the Blood Covenant Part 6. And today uh, we're going to look at a familiar story, maybe with, uh, I just want you to maybe see it in a little different light, but we're going to be looking at Michelle Beth. And uh, these things in the old uh, covenant, in the old scriptures, are like a signpost. And uh, they kind of point to what Jesus would do, but they're not meant to explain his full work of covenant making, and, and nor do they fit in every detail. That's why you got this one and this one and this one. You know what I mean? I mean, I've read books, well, the seven covenants, the five covenants, and all of that. Each one, you know, there's only one covenant. Uh, but it's to help us understand, and, and here we have a story. I say Meshavah, but it's really a story of Jonathan and David, and uh, that's what I want to look out, uh, look at, because Jonathan was uh, he was Saul's son, and sometimes I think when we just read this language, you know, it's uh, just words on a page, but you got to understand he's the crown prince, you know. He, he's next in line. He's like the royal family, you know, that, that's on every tabloid and every newspaper around. Jonathan is it. And, uh, he's, you know, he's the son of Saul. And Saul was called to be the king of Israel. I mean, this is a high destiny that was given to Saul. But we know by his disobedience, and I, and I think what led to his disobedience, you know, I think the prophet said, when you was little in your own eyes, when he got big in his own eyes, uh, that's what led to his disobedience. He ended up a broken man, seeking the counsel of a witch, you know. And not only that, uh, his family... Uh, after that, they was weak, and, and they walked in the pathway of their father. But in the midst of that, there was one that was different, and that was John. And, I, and I'm always uh, taken to the fact, you know, you remember in the field when they were weary, and they were in pursuit, they were in battle, and then the honey's on the ground, and dips that honey up and his eyes were open. He was different from all the rest. Jonathan was different. Uh, he was other family of Saul, but he was completely other than uh, Saul. Uh, Jonathan had a, had a faith in God and a desire to do the will of God. Now, you, when you read these stories, you know, we're always looking for Christ in these stories. And we know David is a type and shadow of Christ. But, uh, so who is Jonathan? So who is Jonathan? That's what we're going to look at. And I said J uh, Jonathan had a faith about him because... When David is brought to the king's court, remember he's brought there as a young man. Remember we talked about how he, when he went and killed Goliath, he wasn't no 35-year-old. He's a teenage boy. Well, he's brought to the king's court to play music and stuff, and there's a drawing there of like precious faith between Jonathan and David. They were, they were drawn. And, you know, uh, when you see these terms in the new scriptures, they, they go back to the old. And uh, they developed a friendship, and, and their friendship deepened to the point that they made a covenant. And I'm going to read you a little bit of this covenant right here in 1 Samuel 18. verse 1, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would let him go no more to his father's house. That means he's keeping David there. 
Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him. Now remember, he's the prince. I mean, you see what's taking place. He's not just wearing an old robe. He's wearing the robe of the guy who's next in line to be king. He's wearing the prince's robe. He takes that robe off, gave it to David, gave him his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. This, this describes the elementary uh, steps of covenant making, where one uh, gifts from the, the covenant maker are given to the covenant partner. And, even, and you got to remember something right here. Both of these guys, when I say guys, let me change that around. Both of these boys are teenagers. Jonathan and David, at this point, they're both teenagers. But the effects of this covenant right here is going to be felt for generations. The reason being is that each one stood, and here's this term, as the representative of their whole families that were yet even unborn. I love that covenant representative because, I mean, that means so much. Now, a short time later, uh, they reaffirmed the covenant here in 1 Samuel 20, a few verses, verse 8. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding if there be any iniquity in me, slay me thyself. Why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And, and verses uh, 14, Thou shalt not only while I yet live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. See how this thing is looking out. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made covenant. They're reaffirming the covenant that was already made with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require at the hand of David's enemies. Jonathan calls David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And in verse uh, 42, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying. Now see, remember we talked about the covenant oath. So here's the covenant oath. Say, the Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. He arose, departed, and Jonathan went to the city. So we see these words here, and I'm going to uh, go back. You know, we use the words uh, kindness, kindly. That's the word Hased. That's that word, the loving kindness. That's the loving kindness of the covenant. It speaks here of how the covenant would be worked out in the lives of their children. And, and in their children's children. The covenant here wasn't really for David and Jonathan. The covenant was for their descendants. Now, how do I know that? Because Jonathan loved David as his own soul. They didn't need a covenant. You, you see what I mean? They did not need a covenant. The covenant was for their descendants, was for their children. Just as if uh, uh, Jesus and the Father don't need a covenant. They don't need a covenant to make sure love stays in place. They love each other. That's who they are. So the covenant here between David and Jonathan is not looking at David and Jonathan, but looking for somebody else. We know as time went on, Saul got afraid of David. He got afraid of the popularity of David. He was afraid that David would take his throne. And that fear turned into hate, and that hate turned into obsession to murder. I mean, so much that it became Saul's passion to have David killed. I mean, that's all he did, was to go out to kill David. But in the meantime, all these plots to have David killed, all they did was serve to bring to Jonathan 
uh, to, to face the reality that God had chosen David to be king after Saul. Now, you got to remember here, I never, Jonathan was the crown prince. He, he had right to succession. And if Jonathan would have wanted to make his throne secure, he would have took the side of his father. But in making covenant with David, he was making a life-changing decision. And in his final uh, statement of the covenant between them, he died to his right to be the next king. And he swore allegiance to David. Let me read that to you in uh, 1 Samuel 23. Verse uh, 17. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel. You see what he's saying here? He's dying to his right to be king. And saying, David, you'll be king. And I shall be next unto thee. And that also saw my father Noah. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Now you've got to understand something here. Remember, this covenant wasn't just for Jonathan and David. It was for their children and their children's children, their descendants. I mean, this is the heart of the covenant. That uh, Jonathan laid down his throne and proclaimed David as king. So to enjoy the covenant relationship, all of Jonathan's descendants would have to say the amen or the yes to the same, to participate in this very covenant. Uh, to, because Jonathan was their covenant representative. You see what I mean? So when Jonathan said, I'm, I'm no longer going to be king, David, you're going to be king, that wasn't just for Jonathan, that was for all of Jonathan's descendants. Because the covenant was struck. David, you're going to be king. You, you, you see what I'm saying here, and this is going to have big implications here here in a minute. And when I, when I say that, I'm, I'm saying therein lies the problem still today. We, we don't say the yes to the covenant or the amen to the covenant because we don't like the terms that was laid down because what about three generations away? They had no say-so in the terms that was laid down between Jonathan and David. You see what I mean? So there was a covenant between the father and the son that was cut. Terms was already laid down. It was swore. It was cut in blood, swore by an oath. But today, Christians don't like the terms of the covenant, so they want another covenant. But see, our rep the covenant is always made in the representative. He's king, and we are not. See, the covenant was that this one would not be king, that this one would. So time passed here. They grew up. David grew up. Uh, Jonathan grew up. They both had kids. So here it comes again. The Philistines attack again. And, I mean, this is a great day of defeat for Israel because we know that Saul and Jonathan both died in battle. Actually, Jonathan's killed. David commits suicide. But they... They lost. Now, we've, we've talked about this before, but 1000 B.C. was a violent place because the first act of a conqueror was to assemble the family of the conquered king, kill all the heirs to the throne, gather them all together. They eliminated all the potential problems. And uh, so it's not surprising when, when the news came that Jonathan and Saul had been killed, there's a panic in the royal house. Everybody fled the mad rush to escape the threat because they knew our king's dead. The Philistines are taking over. There's going to be a new Philistine nursery and 
get Jonathan's kids, which he had more than one, and one of the nurses picks up Michelle Beth, goes to run, she trips and falls, boom, his legs are crushed, he's crippled. Never walked again. He's taken secretly out across the Jordan into the wilderness where he's raised in a little unknown town called Lodabar. Time, time goes on. We know uh, there's a period of unrest. Because remember, jo Jonathan had already given up all rights to the kingdom to David. Well, all Israel, just like today, was not ready to recognize David as king. I mean, he's made king first in Hebron, that for a long time, and then it takes a long time before Israel recognizes him as king. But as time went on, uh, David never forgot the covenant that he'd made with Jonathan. So now that David has established king, and David uh, establishes his kingdom, he began a search for the sons of John. Anybody that anybody that family that he might fulfill his oath and show the covenant kindness, the hasad, the loving kindness. To them. Now, now think about this. David is on a search to find somebody that he can be good to. I mean, I mean, do people even get it? The God is, you know, we look at that because this is not the message preached today. We got an angry God who's mad, who's searching out to judge somebody. But here we get a picture. David is searching for somebody. To be good to. Let me uh, go to 2 Samuel 9 and 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness, Hassan, that I may show this covenant for Jonathan's sake? Look, it ain't even for, for, the, for the kid's sake. I'm not doing this because you deserve it. I'm doing this for Jonathan's sake. Does this begin to give you a picture of who yeah. Jesus is in this story? Mm -hmm. So, it's hard for him to find somebody who's going to tell him where any of the family of Jonathan is at. He's been living in secret over here in this little podunk town called Lodabar. And nobody of the family, nobody of Saul's family is believing that David means it for good. Why would they? They've never seen anything like this before because all other kings kill everybody else from the, from the rivals. And not only that, all the relatives of Saul believe that David was an imposter sitting on the throne that rightly belonged to the, to the sons of Saul. So there's not only, uh, yeah, David's king, there's a hate for David because they're saying, that's my place. You, you see what I mean? So this is not just, oh, yeah, he's king. No, it should be mine. Now, these people would have expected David to kill all the house of Saul before that the house of Saul could rise up and kill him. Right? Fighting over the throne. And that's why they thought David was looking for him. If, you know, they would just understand it. It must be to kill him. That's why David's on the hunt here. Sounds like God today, don't it? God's on the hunt here. He's just looking for somebody he can kill and judge. Because no one understood a covenant of love that extended to even potential contenders for the throne. You see, that this covenant of love even extended to them. They had no idea. The 
there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Zibia, and when they had called unto him, uh, called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Zibia? Ziba, and he said, The servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I might show kindness, Hassan, of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. The king said unto him, Where is he? Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of, of Machir, the son of Amelia, in Lodabar. <coughs> Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Bacchus, the son of Abiel, from Lodabar. Now when Meshebobeth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said to Meshebobeth, and he answered, Be all my servant. But this, let me back up here a little bit. As soon as David finds out where the guy's at, he sends somebody to go fetch him. Now imagine yourself to be Meshavabeth. The imposters on the throne. You know how it's always worked in the past. He's found out where you are. You don't have an army. You're crippled. Here come the horses riding up, dressed up with their David's under David's banner. What do you think? <coughs> they're here, they're here to kill me. The only reason he wants me in <coughs> Jerusalem is to make an example of me. I'm the only one he can find. <coughs> He's probably praying to God, I hope he don't find my other brothers. Let's let me die. Maybe he'll leave the rest of us alone. He thinks he's on a journey to Jerusalem to die. I mean, this guy hated David. I mean, every day while they're out there eating nothing, he realizes David is sitting on his throne in the, in the royal chair with the royal robe that his father, that, that the, the robe that Jonathan had that was now given to David should have been Meshebobes. So he's thinking, David is sitting up there with my robe and my chair, eating at my table. I mean, he was taught from youth up just like we were to hate the Russians. Nowadays, they're taught to hate the Muslims. You know, it, it kind of shifts. But, I mean, in my day, we were taught to hate the Russians. Now, they're, you know, people don't know nothing about the Russians anymore. Now, they hate the Muslims and the North Koreans. And I'm sure when this other generation, they'll be taught to hate somebody else. It's, it's what we do. We teach hate. This guy hated David, even though he had never laid eyes on David. He had no knowledge of the covenant that was between David and his father. He, he was taught to believe David was the enemy and had stolen everything that rightly belonged to him. And again, he believed the only reason David wanted him in Jerusalem was to kill him. I call it judgment day. Right? He just... You know, I've been summoned... So he comes before the king, falls on his face, and he's waiting to hear the orders of execution. Now listen, listen to this. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. I mean, just think of what David, and this guy, can you imagine these things coming to his ears? He's laying in the floor. And David says, fear not, I will surely. I mean, think about the word, surely. I'm going to do it because nothing you did, Michelle Beth. I'm doing this for Jonathan, your father's sake. And not only that, Meshavu Beth, I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And not only that, Meshavu Beth, but thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now here's Meshavu Beth. Can you imagine what's going through? I mean, he's astonished. He can't believe this. He says, 
He bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? The king called Azibia, Saul's servant, said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to his house. Well, before I finish reading that, you know this must have left Jonathan speechless to hear these words. Because he wasn't treated on the basis of his track record. For Jonathan, thy father's sake, is how he's treated. He wasn't treated on the basis of his loyalty to the throne. But on the, he's treated on the basis of a covenant that was made before he was ever even born. Made by his father who stood as the covenant representative for his children and his children's children. And David delighted in Meshebobeth as if Meshebobeth was Jonathan himself. You see what I mean? I mean, he was accepted right into the to the oath and the yes of the covenant that was made years before in the blood setting of, of Jonathan, Jonathan and David, yet it was as fresh as the day that it had been made 30 years ago. But see, here's where, where people get off. Although John, uh, Michelle Beth is confronted personally with the covenant and its promises, there was no need of a further individual covenant to be made between David and Michelle Beth. You, you see what I mean? We want our own covenant. There's no need for another covenant. A covenant's already been established. He doesn't make another covenant with me and God. We're here because of the covenant made with the other. David accepted Meshebobeth solely on the basis that he was in Jonathan at the making of the original covenant. Right? He was, we could say, uh, as Old Testament writers say, he was in the loins of Jonathan. But now he's confronted with the gift of the covenant. So he's brought to a decision. In order to enter in, or to accept the covenant, he had to enter into the pledge of allegiance that Jonathan had made to David, which by doing that would separate him, Meshebobeth, from all other members of the family of Saul. Because the members of the family of Saul are still in hatred of David. Right? So now he's confronted with a choice. Do I enter into this covenant, which is going to separate me from all those who hate David and enter into this covenant. Now to, to enter into this pledge of allegiance would mean to never share in the hatred the, that they had. To enter into this covenant would be a death to all that he called life. Michelle Beth. Because uh, and what I mean all that, all, all that he called life, all of, his, all of his goals, his hopes, his dreams, his ambitions, because what, what would be Meshavah's best hopes and dreams? One day I'll be king. It's rightfully mine. You see what I mean? All he dreamed about was being back, sitting on the throne. He had to give up all of that. And not only that, Think about all the friends that he shared those dreams with. Yeah, man, when you get to be king, he had to give up all that, come dead to it. And not only did he become dead to that, but to rise again from that death, 
and now become a prince in the royal house of David. Because that's what he was becoming. And laying on the floor here, we were reading, he, he accepted, he says yes, he says the amen of his father. He, he comes, you see what I mean? He says the same thing that his father. He swore allegiance to David and allowed the covenant to, to change his life forever. Now, let me continue reading, reading here. And I'll, I'll just go back to verse 10. Thou, therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Meshavabeth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons, 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Meshavabeth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Prince. Meshavabeth had a young son whose name was uh, Machai. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Meshavabeth. So Meshavabeth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both feet. Now, the human race born of Adam bears all the traits of the house of Saul. Because see, we, we don't know, we always call Saul religion. But I'm telling you, we all bear the traits of Saul. Each one has walked in disobedience to God. Each one has lived under the domain and the authority of darkness. I mean, isn't that what he said? We're living the kingdom of darkness translated out of it. But in the midst of this family of Saul, in the midst of this family of Adam, just like Saul's house, there came one who was utterly different than the whole family. One who was completely different. Christ's story is similar to John. And what I mean is Christ was bonded in love to the one hated by the family of Adam. The one that was hated by the family of Adam was God himself, the true king of all. And as Jonathan in this story, Jesus summed us all up in himself. He stood as us and for us and entered into covenant with the Father on our behalf. Now, again, the covenant was made solely with us in view because there didn't need to be a covenant between the Father and the Son. The covenant between David and Jonathan had nothing to do with them. It was for those children's children's children. And as our covenant representative, Christ, he declared and lived the pledge of love and obedience to his Father that was realized to the fullest in his obedience in the blood shedding on the cross when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass, but not my will, but thine be done. His obedience <clears throat> was summed up. And here we are, born 2,000 years later, after the covenant was made, we were born into the family of Adam, crippled by the lie, <coughs> ignorant of the covenant. We lived in, in the darkness with a distorted image of God, always waiting on his wrath, waiting on the knock of our door, Waiting on judgment just like the world is today. And worse than, worse than just coming to kill us, God's coming down here to judge us and put us in hell. Right? So we don't really want to get too close to this God. We hear he's coming. 
of the house of Saul that I can show mercy to? Somebody go find these people. We lived in our wilderness, lost and dead to God in our hideout called Lodabar. But thank God, David, thank God, Jesus Christ, thank God, God our Father never gave up pursuit and said, surely there must be somebody left and I will not rest until I can find the descendants of them that I can keep my covenant oath to show kindness to them. He made an oath to show kindness by my loving kindness have I drawn thee. I mean, see, this covenant is so great and so awesome. He's made a covenant and said, surely go find somebody for me to be good to. You know, I'm like Isaiah. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Here I am, you know. But I'm telling you, when, when we first heard that he was coming, we were in the shame, shape of Meshavabat. Why does he want me? Surely he's... Everyone in the scriptures, they said, you've just come to bring my sin to remembrance. I know that's all you've come to do. You know, with the prophets and everything, you've just come to bring my sin to remembrance. That's why he said in the new covenant that I make with you, your, your uh, sin and iniquity, I will remember no more. Never gave up his pursuit. And, and finally, we are summoned by the Holy Spirit to hear the gospel. And again, we believe we would hear the words of an angry God, but instead we heard the words of covenant, the words of love, and the words of forgiveness. And our track record of rebellion and disobedience had been had been gone. They were gone. They were they were done away. How is that? If they were, it was dismissed in the covenant made before we were born. Because in our covenant representative, there was no disobedience. There was only love and only loyalty. In our covenant head. So, let me just go over here to Ephesians. Now let me read these verses to you. Just think about Meshavabeth. And the pursuit of this covenant. And what he's writing to the Ephesians who, who don't know what's taking place. Now listen to this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, you see? So he's telling them something about a covenant. Same thing that took place right here. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, see the king taking over? In the heavenly places far above, principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come, hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head, gave him to be the covenant representative over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. All the riches earned by the Lord Jesus Christ turned over to us, set right on the table for us to come in. Heirs of God, joint heirs. We were not treated as individuals in isolation. We don't have a private covenant with God. The covenant was made. Its terms, conditions, promises made sure in Christ 2,000 years ago. And all that he did, he acted for us and as us. And the gospel has called us to personally enter the covenant because 
You remember Jonathan and his son? Because we were in Christ when the covenant was made. Now see how important it is you say, what do you mean we were in Christ? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Now can you see why he made such a statement? Because now in the cutting of that covenant, all the benefits now can be extended to every Jew and Gentile and kindred and tongue and nation in the world because they were all summed up in the covenant head, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, that's, that is awesome. I mean, that is, that is great. Our decision was our response to the covenant that divine love had made. To say yes to the yes of, uh, of Jesus, the covenant head. To die in his death to independence and, in, and disobedience and confessing him as Lord and submitting to the Father. You see, all the terms of the covenant. Here in Ephesians, you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Time passed, you walked according. You know all those verses. Among whom we all had our conversation in the lust of our flesh. Now can you see wanting that throne, wanting that kingdom for yourself? Or by nature the children of wrath, even, even as others, but God who was rich in mirth, mercy, in Hassad, God who was rich in his covenant loving kindness. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, as he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, raised us up together out of Lodabar, brought us into the royal palace, seated us together in heavenly places in Christ. And you remember here when it says the working of his mighty power? Now let me just let me just tell you what, what this is. Meshavabeth just changed families. Meshavabeth a minute ago is of the household of Saul. You see what I mean? He's of the household of Saul. He's a descendant of Saul. He's, he's all of these things. But now he's no longer a descendant of Saul. He is, uh, now if anybody would know and ask who he is, he, as if he's Jonathan himself, he's uh, the crown prince of Israel. And what that means for us is we die to being part of the family of Adam Jesus said you must be what? Born again. Born from above. We die to the, to, the, to the part of the family of Adam, the old man, to being included in the royal household of the new man. Now in doing this, this, this meant incurring the wrath of the family of sin and darkness that we were once a part of. Jesus said they, they hated me first. They'll treat us like they treated him. And all this takes place by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit, his mighty power. And we who live 2,000 years after the covenant was, was made are united to Jesus, our covenant head, and made partakers of his history, his obedience, partaking of his life, we take our place at the royal table along with all the other royal princesses. Basking in the love of the Father, we eat the meal of the covenant. Now, let me just read these verses to you right here. And then we'll, then we'll quit. I told you I wouldn't keep it on tonight. You remember I told you we were summoned by the gospel? It was the gospel that came to meet us in our house in Lodabar that summoned us. 1 Peter 1 and 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. In other words, 
Guys, you've been summoned. And, you know, he went on to tell them about, about Jesus. And then he says, because you've been summoned, wherefore lay aside all malice, guile, hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisies, envies, evil speaking. You see what I mean? You're confronted with this choice, and what are you going to do? Are you just going to leave all this other stuff behind because you came out of a household that was nothing but malice and guile and hypocrisy and envies and evil speaking? Evil speaking, that throne should be ours. Everything, everything, that should be ours. We're the ones who should be sitting on the throne. But the gospel, Peter says, has came to you. Now, lay that stuff aside. Leave it there. And then he says, as newborn babes, remember I told you you're changing families? And as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If he has come at mercy, if he has come at loving kindness, have you come to this conclusion yet that the Lord is good? To whom coming as a, a, a living stone disallowed indeed of them, a chosen of God and precious? Can you see this whole story? King Saul, David, David is rejected. Saul wants him dead. But here he's referred to these newborn babes. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. A what? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion. And we talked about Zion. Zion, that, that fellowship, that, that fellowship of God and man together, a joyous celebration. I've laid at Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, not an enemy. Not an angry God. Not a, a, a God of, to be feared and judgment and wrath. But to you who believe and have experienced and tasted and seen that he is good. To you that believe. What is he? There's only one word and I can end up. Uh, he's precious. Mm -hmm. Meshavah laying on the floor. He thought he was going to be killed. To you who have been in his presence and experience a little taste of his loving kindness which comes at his table, what word can you say? Oh, brother, Jesus is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, disobedient, they're not coming. They've heard the gospel. They said, all he wants to do is kill us. I'm just going to stay right here. I'm not going up because I know, everybody said, I know the way things are. He's a, he's a God of wrath and judgment. I'll just stay put right here. They're disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. But you, but me and you, us, we, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Holy nation. A peculiar people. That's a purchased people. A blood bought people. That's what that means. Don't mean odd and weird. That means you're blood bought. Peculiar. In other words, in our covenant head who summed us all up, you've already been bought. You're already owned. They're owned too. They were still in Israel, even though they lived in Lodabar, even though they were living in the wilderness, they still had rights to the table. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the family of darkness, out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the land of Lodabar, into his marvelous light. Which in time past you were not a people. But now, not some glad day, but now, you who were nobody, you were in darkness, you were in low bar, you who were a cripple, are now of the royal family, the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, which had not obtained covenant, 
but now have obtained mercy or covenant. Covenant loving kindness. Don't think of this word mercy here as pity because David wasn't having pity on him as look, oh, let's throw him some crumbs. He said, he will eat at my table. You don't give pity to those at your table. They're brought into a joyous celebration Amen. and the wine and the yes. singing and the dancing all flowed. He's brought into a celebration. Yes. Those who were not a people are now brought into the royal family of God. They had to obtain covenant, but now they are brought into full covenant standing. And then he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I'm begging you as strangers and pilgrims. Now, why is he calling them strangers and pilgrims? Because now they are strangers and pilgrims to all the family that they just left. Everything they were accustomed to is now they're strangers to it. They're pilgrims from, from it. You see what I mean? They've left Lodabar, and now they have been brought into the house of the royal family of God. And all, all Peter is saying here in a nutshell is don't try to pack your bags and bring all them old dirty clothes that you had down there that was dirty because everything that you need will be provided for in this house. Yes. A whole new wardrobe, yes. a whole new everything. Oh, so yes. leave all of that stuff behind. That's strangers and stuff too. You don't need any of that. Just come on over here, come to the table, and sit down and eat. And I, I will quit. <laughs>